All right, today, top 10 tips on using aquarium heaters in our reef tanks. And really, all of those tips, I wish somebody had told both of us yeah. right away in the beginning. Yeah, number one tip, here it is. This is only a fine tuning solution for your heat in your tank. The actual heater is the room. So you're, wherever you have your tank set up, if it's 70 degrees, if it's 60 degrees, if it's 80 degrees, that's where your tank's gonna start and your heater and your fans do the rest. So think about your AC, think about your furnace, think about windows being open, think about the temperature of the room surrounding your tank first and then apply a heater to it afterwards. Yeah, so the things that you really need to pick up on what he just said is when I open up my windows in mm. the middle of the summer and it's now 85 degrees in my uh, house, well, you know what? Uh, so is going to be the tank. Uh, also, sometimes it's just cheaper to uh, heat the room a little bit than it oh, is yeah. to heat the tank. Yeah. So if I'm actually running that room down at 65, I'm using a lot of electricity to heat the uh, mm. room, or I'm gonna have to use big heaters as well yep. to even to be able to achieve that. So that's one of those things too, is when you think about this fine tuning heater and how many you need, it's really kind of the starting point uh, of the room. So again, think about your furnace, think about your AC, think about your windows and know that the temperature of the room is actually heating the tank and this is just fine tuning it. All right, number two, probably the most important one of the day, at least the most impactful. Yeah, big tip here. Do not put this thing anywhere where it can run dry, which means the return pump that often gets run dry if your ATO goes off or some of those uh, corner overflows on tank where you can, it seems like you have enough room to put a heater, but those could also run dry. It's just a recipe for disaster. So make sure to put it somewhere in your sump where it will always be submerged, always. And even I'll think it a little bit like, what if uh, I wanna do maintenance in the sump and suck it dry? Is there an area where it wouldn't be affected by that? Yeah. And it would still maintain being submerged because one of these times, in a long enough timeline, you'll forget to turn the heater off, it'll melt through the bottom of your sump, which is a total disaster, Ooh. and even worse, kind of a fire hazard yeah. as well. So if you're thinking right now, oh man, I do have this in my return pump area or any other place where it could run dry if say the auto top off turned off and it started the water started low, level started to go down or even in your tank where if it dropped a couple of inches for any reason, now part of it is exposed, anywhere where it's not submerged in water, go fix that today. Right now. Don't wait any more time. It should be solved today because it's a really big deal. And it's one of those big tips that if you solve this, you'll never run into the issues that other people have. All right, tip number three, these things break all the time. They're not reliable as, they, as you would hope they would be, which means you have to account for when one breaks, which is why a lot of us run redundant heaters or two heaters instead of one, and one has a backup, both as a primary. Yeah, so just hoping that you're around uh, when you happen to notice it breaks is probably not a good strategy in the long <laughs> run. Uh, in fact, it's a terrible one. So a lot of people will run redundant heaters, and it may seem like if I needed a 200-watt heater to run my tank that I should get two 200-watt heaters, and that's the wrong answer, actually. That's it's probably a the power. tip right here. Yeah. Don't get two 200-watt heaters in that case because it gets stuck on just as easy as it gets stuck off, and now it'll overheat your tank way too fast. So the flip side of that would be if 200 was the right number, should I get two 100s, which Seems is logical. essentially a 100 heater? Yeah. No, because now it's also gonna be cold, which is uh, also, <laughs> and you'd have to know that it was cold as well, which may take days unless you're mm. really keeping a close tab on it. There is an answer. Yes, the answer is split the difference. Yeah. So about a 75 watt heater. So if you had, or 75% uh, power. Yeah. So if 200 was the right answer for you, you know, you'll look in the little uh, graph of what is the right heater size for you from the manufacturer take it down to about 75% and then get two of those and you kind of split the difference. It won't overheat too fast and it also won't get cold uh, too fast as well. And you've added that redundancy and that's a tip. All right, number four, there's a theme building here. These <laughs> things do break all the time and waiting for them to break, not the best answer because that's when bad stuff happens can actually prevent it as well. Yeah, so the tip is to replace your heaters once a year. And, and we're talking about the thermostats on the heater specifically because these things toggle off and on uh, hundreds and thousands, maybe up to a million times a year, in which case it's just a part that's gonna wear out. And for the cost of 30 to 50 bucks per year, it's just worthwhile in the safety to swap them out. Yeah, so your whole tank, think of the entire investment that you put on your tank. 
is all relying on this thing right here, yeah. turning on and off again, like up to a million times a year. Turn off every couple minutes, on and off, on and off, and there's moving parts in there and they get stuck, mm -hmm. stuck on just as uh, often as stuck off. So here's the thing. You do not want to wait until it breaks unless you have a whole series of alarms and controllers on there because you would probably never know. Ask yourself this question. If the heater got stuck on, how would I ever know? Mm, and if the I answer is you don't know, definitely you're in the camp of uh, I should actually just replace this every year and preempt it so I don't have to be one of those people that lost all of my pets, all of my corals, and all of my time and money over a $30 investment here. Now, also, if you do have one of these types of heaters where the thermostat's actually built into it already, mm -hmm. these are also $30, $40 heaters. You end up throwing the whole thing away. Uh, in some cases with the BRS heater, you have this German-made titanium big heat sink. These things don't fail uh, as you know, often. The actual element, because this thing doesn't have the moving part in it, it's the thermostat. So this is the part you want to replace every year. Number five tip is actually consider where is this thing measuring the temperature from? Yeah, so the tip here is to find out where the thermostat is in your heater. Uh, for example, this is just a heating element, so it doesn't have a thermostat regulating itself and regulating the temperature. Whereas this one with a built-in control or thermostat does have a thermostat, but you wonder where is it taking the temperature from? A lot of times, it's in the top of the cap of the heater and that's where it regulates the temperature, meaning it should probably be submerged. Yeah, that is the big piece here. If you didn't know this, uh, well, maybe when I installed it, I'd actually install it in a manner where the top piece is actually exposed to water. Mm. Now that violates the, uh, what is it, number two no-no uh, of don't ever let this thing get <laughs> submerged. But at the same time, if you know where it is, you can get a better idea of maintaining uh, of the temperature in it. I'll also note, once you know where it is too, is you can know some of the faults of some types of heaters. Yep. So, you know, these are cheap. These are inexpensive and makes them pretty attractive. But if you know that it's in here, you also know that when this heating element heats up, it actually heats up the thermostat in here. So it ends up having extra cycles on yep. and off when the actual thermostat's incorporated into the heating element itself, but there are other alternatives. Some of those so other alternatives here are having the thermostat separate. So you'll see the thermostat separate, and now the probe is separate as well, and mm -hmm. I can go put this anywhere I want, and now it's very obvious where I would put this uh, probe. But there are also heaters like this one <laughs> that have that probe that comes off as well. So when you're looking at the pictures of the heaters uh, and you're trying to decide which one, if you can't visibly see where the actual thermostat is on these, it's probably incorporated into the top and you should make sure that that thing is submerged at all times. All right, number six, there's a flip side to that. Yeah, so like he said, we were just talking about the separate temp probe. So the tip here is to take extra special care and consideration when placing your separate temp probes. Some of these things have like a six foot cord on them. Some of them have like a three or four inch cord on them. So just be cautious or kind of cognizant of where you're putting this thing. Like if my heater is right here and the water's flowing across it, if I put my temperature probe or that probe on the other side, it's going to register that freshly heated water off my heater and might not actually heat my tank as much as I wanted it to. So we usually put them upstream of that or somewhere remotely away from the heating element. There's also a major risk element to this Very as much well. so, yeah. Yeah, so if you put this thing, uh, make sure wherever you put it, really consider your reliance on these suction cups as well because what happens now is this thing is actually measuring the temperature of your mm. tank and telling the heater to turn on and off. What happens if this accidentally gets bumped or pulled out of the tank, or worse yet, you put it in a place that it isn't submerged, uh, like uh, in your return pump area <laughs> or anywhere else like that. Yeah. Now it's reading the temperature of your room, 70 degrees, desperately trying to get the tank up to uh, you know 78 in most cases. So if that's the case, it's just gonna keep heating and heating. Mm. So when you do have an external thermometer or, or, or thermostat, make sure that it's a place that will always be submerged, even if like you're tugging on cords yeah. or anything else, yeah. that no matter what, never on a long enough timeline, never ever will this ever get submerged. Maybe I put uh, in a magnet holder, I did something to make sure that that will never happen because it is definitely a risk when these things are separate. All right, number seven, there's a lot of debate as to the perfect temperature for your tank, and uh, there's a tip here. Yeah, the, this is a quick tip. 
skip the debate, set it to 78 degrees. We have all of our tanks at 78 degrees. A mass majority of reefers have it set to 78 degrees, where we find a lot of the best results. So just set your heaters to 78. There's a nerdy end of this that so you could go in and try to figure out the perfect temp from where this coral came from. Mm -hmm. Not just the regional area, but also some of these things are collected at 100 feet, some of them are collected at 10 feet. They have different temperatures. But the answer to that question is, is we see consistent results at 78, and I personally have never found a reason to run it any other temperature. All right, number eight, this hits that part we talked about earlier, which is how would you even know if the heater stopped working? Yeah, so the tip here is to get a thermometer because I can walk by this tank and never know what temperature is just by visually. And a lot of times it does take some time, whether it's overheating or, or cooling down. It takes a while for you to see visual signs of that in the tank. So rather than walking by and sticking my finger in and wondering what the temperature is, there's three ways that you should monitor the temperature of your tank. First one is come by with a little thermometer and test it and find out what it is, but there's a better and best option. Yeah, so a better option is actually, even though they're cheap and they're not necessarily the most accurate, those little stickers that you can yeah, put on the glass. The rainbow looking ones. Yeah, they just tell you the temperature, they cost five bucks, I can walk by at a glance and know that mm -hmm. like things are generally okay. Without that, the visual indication would be things are dying. I'd rather preempt uh, things that are dying because that's the state at which the temperature usually we would tell you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you could dip your finger in there every day, but the flip side of that is keeping your hands out of the tank generally is a good idea yeah. for you and the fish and the coral as well. <laughs> so probably not the best way, but there is a best way, which is a visual or audible uh, or a visual uh, or audible alarm, meaning it's screaming at you, Ooh. telling you beep, 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 save me. Yeah, it's, uh, a lot of this comes with like a, an aquarium controller or you can even get separate uh, temperature sensors off the side that will, uh, some will send you emails, texts, some will just have a loud alarm going off, but in, it's way better than you just walking by, looking at the tank and guessing what the temperature might be. Some of the better uh, 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 extra external thermostats will also have an audible alarm, but yeah. I mean, screaming at you saying, save the tank. I can hear it from the other room. I didn't have to walk by and see it. The only part of that past that is those aquarium controllers, which will not only set off an audible alarm in many cases, mm -hmm. but will actually start sending you those text messages. Yeah. So you can get, uh, they're not the cheapest thing, but as you spend more and more money on your tank and more time and investment into it, getting a text message and email or push notification through apps, uh, like the one on the Apex Fusion, telling you, hey, the temperature is way off, go do something about it. And in this case, if it's uh, also hooked up to something like an Apex, you can actually just turn the heater off for you and save the day. Number nine, one of the more popular heaters, but mm. there is a factor to consider. Yeah, so the tip here is when you're looking at your heater, also take into account the length of it. So uh, a 300 watt in the Eheim Jaeger series is far greater, bigger than a 300 watt in like the bulk reef supply titanium one. So you have to account for some of these. And I've, I've got a lot of phone calls when I was on customer service, even did it myself, where I bought a big long heater, had no idea of how big it would be, get it to my sump, and I just can't fit it in any of my chambers. It doesn't fit. And then it goes back to that, you know, tip number two is, okay, maybe I can fit it diagonally, but most of it, even the thermostat, is now exposed to air. You beat me to the punch on the diagonally <laughs> thing. Uh, a lot of people will do that because I bought this heater. It's now wet. Mm -hmm. uh, like, it's hard to return wet used items. And I stuck it in the side here. Well, yeah, it fits in there now. But what happens when it's not submerged uh, diagonally? What yeah. happens when uh, ATO stops working? Well, you know, you really got to think about those things because of rule number two, which is like, don't burn down your house or melt <laughs> your sump. So think about the length of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, it, they, most of them will tell you exactly how long mm -hmm. the, uh, in the product descriptions. So, you know, this guy is a 100 watt heater. It's tiny, right? This is actually only a 150 watt heater. It is way, way, way bigger. And Probably the one that you got the most calls about is the Glass Eheimjäger 300 watt, which is Big. super, super long, right? Yeah. Does not fit in most sumps. So think about the size, make sure you measure it out, and then you'll get the right tool for the right job the first time. All right, number 10, 
probably the most disappointing thing you'll mm. come to realize, but it's true. Yeah, the tip here is to calibrate your heater because most of them, even the ones that we've tested, come out of the box and they are wrong, meaning that if I set it to 78 degrees, I should be able to drop it in my tank, walk away thinking that my tank's gonna be 78 degrees, but actually it might be upwards of like five degrees off or five degrees lower, or five degrees higher. So calibrate your heater. Not all heaters have a calibration uh, uh, ability on them. Uh, some of them do, the best ones will do, but you can adjust for it too if you don't have an ability to calibrate. You can uh, use some thermometers and find out if yours is off and then adjust with the uh, different temperature setting. I've actually seen them off as much as six degrees. Yeah. That means if you set it to 78, it might actually be 72, and it might actually be 84, Ooh. Yeah, that much. <laughs> uh, and so uh, almost all of them off two to three degrees. Yep. Uh, it's very disappointing. Uh, you would think that they'd be better than that. I will tell you, I don't know why, but uh, all of our tanks, again, these reef tanks are really expensive, are all dependent on this like $30 piece of equipment. And I think it's kind of a thing that left over from like a freshwater world mm. where the, some of the tanks are just less expensive. So putting a really nice heater on your tank probably didn't make a lot of sense in yeah, that case. Yeah. Uh, but here, like a little different world. So you do definitely want to know the temperature. It is easy as just using a thermometer, putting it in the tank, getting a reading. Uh, better yet, use two of them and average it. We sell some really nice ones like the mm -hmm. HANA and there's a long stem one. They're yep. NIST validated uh, and you can measure against that some of them you can actually program in here and calibrate it and it will now read correctly yep some of them you turn that little dial on it and uh, some of them if i know it's off four degrees I just, I just have to account for it yep so know that going into it it's always best to actually calibrate them and confirm that they're working correctly all right so if there's one tip that's more important than <laughs> all the others let it be yeah for me the tip is uh don't go exploring the, the forums or the groups and trying to pinpoint the right temperature for your tank set it to 78 degrees you'll be just as good as us yeah for me actually it's one that we didn't like outright say but kind of had let a like a insight into which yeah. is these things fail all the time. Number one piece of equipment that fails. It's very, very inexpensive. They cost 30 bucks. They turn on and off a million times a year. The moment that you just accept that and account for it, then your trajectory for your tank goes way up. Yes. Meaning the people that change these things out every year have a way longer success trajectory than the people that wait for them to break and just hope that they're around for them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, think about that and you can actually you know, really have a much more successful journey in reefing. Now, if you want to see any of these heaters, you can find them over at bulkreefsupply.com right here, but you can also go Ooh. see some of Randy's testing on these heaters to see that calibration <laughs> and how far some of them were off and actually how close some of them were as well. And you can see that right here.